So welcome everyone. We're really glad to have you here with us. As we kick off, I want to just remind you that our mission here at Stukit is to help you help your students help the world. And right now, I am happy to introduce to you Stuart Draper. He is the founder and CEO here at Stukit, and he's going to share some thoughts with you. Thanks, Paul, and thank you to all of you for taking time to be with us and join us here today. Uh, for 10 years now, Stuka has been on a mission, as Paul said, to help educators help students help the world. And uh, we hope that it doesn't take very long for you to have that mission memorized as well, because we want you to be a part of the mission with us. Uh, it takes the educators for us to be able to fulfill our mission. Um, I was a marketing major in college. I took the supply chain class, had to take the intro to supply chain class. And I remember feeling lost. I do remember, like, you know how in accounting, you remember, oh, it was debits and credits. So economics, that was supply and demand, uh, supply chain. That was like shipping stuff. That was um, the, the root beer game. I remember that, playing this game. Uh, what we've tried to do here at Stukent is build what we wish we had had when we were in college. Uh, the Rootberg game takes about an hour to go through. Uh, our simulations that we're working on, we call them simternships. They provide a semester long learning experience for your students. And we pair those with up-to-date courseware that these some some of the speakers here today are are our authors here at Stukent that have worked on this supply chain content with us, and I'm ex so excited for you to hear from them. So I don't want to take much more of your time. Um, we're trying to build a community. The, the the purpose of this today isn't just to sell Stukent products, uh, and I hope you don't feel that, but rather that you feel like you're getting great information that will help you in your careers as educators. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Stuart Draper, and I'll see you around. Thanks, Stuart. Well, we have an incredible lineup today, and we want to get it started right now. So kicking off, we're going to have Danica Porter come on screen. Danica obtained her Master's of Engineering from MIT in Systems and Supply Chain. She's a partner at IOTA Consulting, a management consultant firm, where she works in supply chain and project management and also data analytics and heavy manufacturing and technology. She does a lot. Danica is the co-founder and the COO of Vita Nova Tech, a fertility company. Additionally, Danica is completing her PhD in cardiology at the Cummings School of Medicine, where she's using machine learning to help predict sudden cardiac death by rewriting the algorithms used to find certain markers. Danica is also the author of Stukin's Principles of Supply Chain Management and Operations Courseware, which was released last fall. Um, welcome, Danica. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I listened to that. And I'm, it's, a, it's a bit, I guess, overwhelming to hear all the stuff I do. But then I look at my day timer. I'm like, oh, yeah, no, that, that checks out. Yeah. Well, before I turn the time over to Danica, I just want to let everyone on this uh, webinar today know that by just as a free gift for attending, we want to give each of you free instructor access to Danica's courseware, uh, Principles of Supply Chain Management and Operations. If you click on the link that's on your screen now, um, we'll give you free instructor access. With that instructor access, you'll be able to review the entire courseware that Danica wrote. You'll be able to see the lesson plans, the sample syllabus, the expert sessions, the quizzes, everything, and you'll be able to get a good feel of it and see if you feel like it's a right fit for your classroom. So I invite you to click on that link and do that. And Danica, I'm gonna turn the time over to you. And when you're finished, I'll hop on and we'll do the Q&A. Perfect, thank you so much. All right. I will dive right in. Obviously, AI, machine learning, it's a big thing right now. It's a really big deal. It's, you know, impacting everything, uh, including supply chain. And it's like, how can we better use this to make more effective supply chains? How do we use it to our benefit? Because 
I'll go through some of the shortcomings that we have with AI if it's not employed properly. So quick agenda for today. We're just going to review AI and ML, just what they are specifically and how they work with each other. <clears throat> then we'll go into the challenges of AI and ML, what it does, what they can do, the shortcomings, why do we use it, and where is it used, and then we'll finish up with opportunities. So these are case studies, real life ones that use AI and ML, and how it can actually benefit you know, everyone, companies, um, uh, the actual supply chain itself, uh, and end results when it is employed and deployed properly. So like I said, quick review of artificial intelligence. So it's just that ability for a computer to perform tasks. You're telling it to do something and it's going to go through. I think people think that it's intuitive and it's actually not. Um, the computer and the algorithms that AI are based on require data and direction. So an example, everything you put into chat GPT, it's uh, included and it's learning from what you put into it. Um, so machine learning, well, it's just a subset of AI. It's these, you know, specific algorithms and they learn through experience or new data sets. It works <clears throat> really well in a warehouse or in operations because it's constantly getting all of this data um, and it can review and update itself, you know, sort of without human interference. It can pull from a very connected um, warehouse. And so these algorithms can evolve as more and more and more data, right? It's just pattern recognition. And so the more data it gets, the more refined its patterns get. So machine learning is amazing because it's really useful for finding these sort of unknown patterns or relationships in data, you know, sales, like this sells really well with this, or these are the days that you should be ordering because the price seems to be the lowest, or when you order on a Tuesday, you actually get your uh, product a day sooner for whatever reason. Right? It can pick up on all these nuanced things that the human eye can't see easily, right? It can very quickly uh, pick it up. So it's a really effective tool to gain immense amount of insight or you know, improve efficiency in these day-to-day -day operations. And you know, this future forward view of, hey, you should do this, or you should sell these things together, or you should run these two back, you know, these two products back to back. But, you know, like I said, with anything, we need to figure out and, and understand really what it is. So like I said, with machine learning, it's just that useful um, to gain insight and efficiency for finding these unknown patterns. And I have a lovely little photo here of all the code that uh, some people can use. Of course, this is like a beautiful image. My code uh, is typically uh, white code on a black screen. I don't get this fun color stuff. But <clears throat> again, really important that we understand truly what machine learning is. I think everyone thinks it's like this lovely crystal ball and you can, you know, oh, it'll tell you anything. It's like, well, it's actually only telling you a pattern based on the data that, you know, it was fed. So some of the best and, you know, nice highlights of it is that it can group data by finding these underlying relationships. Like I said, it works typically best on numerical data. While we have large language models now, they are still developing. I mean, I used to have examples where I would <clears throat> talk about letting machine learning write your, your Valentine's Day cards. And uh, those are laughable examples because they're just the language models still have a long way to come. They're getting there. But again, it just depends on all that different use of data. And someone on the back end has to say, this is like this or this is like this. But all the different um, languages and the slang that you know everyone uses, very arduous job. So they are getting better, but for the most part um, in supply chain, we don't really need to use the large language models. We can rely on that numerical data. Uh, it also is a nice way because it provides a visualization of the relationships and their strengths, products. Um, you know, there's some open AI and open market products and you can, pull out the visual. So it's not just code and it's not just providing you a number saying, oh, this is the regression or this is the, the strength that actually can show you visually on a graph. Obviously, super useful in any field as well. It's seen in medicine. It's seen in 
you know, all types of different technologies. But there's a lot of time, a lot of issues, like I said. So you can see the, <laughs> these are news clippings that I have pulled. So a few companies have used AI and then unfortunately it resulted in not a great outcome, right? So there was a, an AI recruiting tool and it actually didn't hire a single female um, because that's what it had looked at the data set of who had been hired and then it just employed it. So understanding that the bias that you have in your data is then transferred and transferred and used in your, you know, AI and machine learning. Again, it's it's not particularly intuitive. It's not going to say, oh, this doesn't make sense. It's like well, the previous data has said, therefore, we're going to go forward. So lots and lots and lots of like shortcomings, like I said, it's that garbage in, gar garbage out theory, and it it really, really applies here. So the data that you are going to use, especially if you're using it in supply chain, really needs to be accurate. It needs to be clean and cleansed. And if someone inputs, you know, dates in a different way, your machine learning is not necessarily going to understand that that is the same way if you write it day, month, year, or month, day, year, or you actually type it out. Those are all seen as unique data points. Um, again, it's getting better, but that's a lot of work that has to go into it. So there's still a lot going on. And so on the, the end where you would like to use it, make sure that the data that you're inputting into a system is really standardized because that will help get you to a better place. So again, using the right machine learning algorithms are also you know part and parcel of getting an outcome that matches what is really needed or what is making sense for you know the company or the situation that you find yourself in when i talk about machine learning and supply chain with my students i constantly say okay you need to understand that the data that you're using needs to be accurate it needs to be clean because otherwise you're going to end up with all kinds of weird and wonky things that say you need to order like this a mass amount of you know quantity or you need to you know be hiring all these people because your algorithm is saying, but it's like, oh, you pulled from, you know, really high output or, you know, seasonally um, assisted data. It's around, you know, the holidays. And of course, there's always higher demand and whatnot. So if you use that then in your dating, you say, oh, yeah, you can just look at these past three months and it includes one of these heavy, heavy months. Your um, result is that you're going to be over hiring, over producing. So again, it's really, really important to know what your uh, data is going to say so a little bit more diving into these shortcomings it's not entirely predictive right machine learning and any of the ai it's it's used using prior data finding these relationships and making predictions so it's really only as good as that data is provided and supply chains are incredibly complex that's why we really haven't seen a massive AI or ML structure for supply chain because there are so many moving parts, right? We'll see AI in a certain aspect, oh, improve your sourcing or oh, improve your transportation. But there's no wide sweeping thing because supply chains are so complex, right? There's so many different functions and they're all interwoven into each other. And another sort of downside of supply chain is, is that each department is almost incentivized to fight against or work against another department. Transportation, you must reduce your costs. Okay, great. Well, we're only gonna do a few different, uh, you know, loads in and out. It's like, cool, now my inventory is gonna go through the roof and maybe that product will end up expiring or we don't need as much or we don't want to order as much. We don't have the physical space, but the transportation department's like, well, we have to cut costs, so we're just gonna have less runs. Um, and so, they end up having this interdepartmental competition, which is a really bad thing for supply chain overall, for the efficiencies. It doesn't actually help anybody. We need that more holistic approach to looking at supply chain. There's no specific AI tool for that, but we can use AI in the departments, but talking to each other, you know, the human uh, element that goes behind all of that to understand, okay, well, this is what is beneficial for my department, but what's beneficial to yours and how is that going to 
um, impact each other. <clears throat> so obviously, you have all these shortcomings. Why do we use it at all, right? Well, like I said before, really quickly finds patterns in that data and how many service hours there are, or we can link things to weather. We can pull in all this other information to truly try and understand when something is needed or when sales are really high or um, when we need to do a preventative maintenance or refurb something, right? It can group this data by likeness that we don't even see to the, the human eye might not see or we might not um, relate pieces of data. That machine learning can do that for us. It, it gives us that you know, insight. Uh, it doesn't have those you know, tired eyes or whatnot. <clears throat> Obviously, it can provide insight into new products. Well, we know that this new product coming on is similar to a couple others, and it can take the data from those prior two and then give you know, a little bit of a predictive analysis saying, OK, these conditions, this is what the shale should be. Therefore, this is what you should be producing. This is potentially what the demand is, all these things. It gives that really cool uh, insight into how something could perform. And then a fun thing also is that it helps for you can use it to help forecast the number of supply chain students. Obviously, supply chain went from sort of it was known and, and talked about in, you know, 2016, 17, 18, 19. It was kind of getting a little bit cooler. Then we had COVID and it erupted right supply chain is everywhere i don't think you could open a newspaper article on your phone or physical paper or go anywhere without hearing supply chain it felt a bit like the you know lady gaga comment of one day you're not going to be able to go to a coffee shop without hearing you know a song by me or my name that was supply chain right it has just become such a big deal and it's it's very obvious that people don't truly understand it they think of supply chain as just procurement or or just one part of it but it's really important to understand that supply chain is, is a whole big thing so we need a lot more people going into supply chain to then fulfill all these new roles that have just what seems like they've popped out of the snow like daisies but they've always been there and now they're just highlighted a bit more so you can use machine learning to look at industry trends and uh the number of supply chain students that you could potentially be getting how to increase you know your program hiring more professors, right? We can use machine learning, like I said, in, in every different industry, uh, including how to help us move forward with supply chain. <clears throat> so some of the coolest places that AI and machine learning have been used um, is that they're in production. How much should I run? How long should the production run be? How much should I produce? When do I switch? Do I want longer runs? Do I want shorter runs? What about planning? What about warehousing? How big should the warehouse be? What should it have in it? Where should the warehouse be, right? All of this, um, these questions can, you know, be given to um, AI or to machine learning specific algorithms to figure out what we should do with this, right? Where do we think that these sales are going to come from? Where should we open a new warehouse? What's the lifespan of this heavy duty piece of equipment that's, you know, multiple millions of dollars how long do we think it will last in these conditions right some cases the industry already has the data in some cases the company already has the data it's like well we already have a shop in this part of the world and this is how this functions it doesn't do very well in dry climates and these are the problems that it has when it's in super humid climates right again it can you can pull in all of that data of course you have to be collecting the data in order to use the AI or any of the machine learning algorithms. <clears throat> Obviously, it helps with improving uh, the planning of resources. How many people do you need or what materials do you need and when do you need them? Uh, warehouse location selections. That famous line when you're on any, any type of online shopping, ooh, you like this or this is in your shopping cart. Other people who bought that are buying this. That's a very typical, um, Hey, nearest neighbors machine learning algorithm. It's looking at your characteristics as, as to what you've paused on and how long you've paused on this image and what you have then put into your cart and saying, oh, other people that put this into their cart also bought these, you know, six different, you're like, how does this happen? Well, that's how, right? It's collecting all that data on, on the other end. And sometimes it helps promote sales. 
people will be like, oh, that is a cool aisle. I do need toothpaste if I'm buying a toothbrush or I'm buying dental floss or, you know, orange juice or something else. So they're used kind of everywhere. So obviously now that we've talked about the shortcomings, where we can use it, it's not a bad thing for us to dive right into some of the case studies. And these are things that I have done in my work experience. So just having a 34% decrease in redundant inventory. So there is safety stock and then there's excess inventory. So that's one of those. Um, an 85% decrease in well ruptured. So I worked with an oil and gas company, well, a company that collected all of the data on all of the fracking sites <clears throat> in a couple countries and just trying to decrease well ruptures. Well, that was a perfect place. We have data collected every two seconds on all of these different wells. So it's pretty cool. And that's a great place for machine learning. Again, you have all this information. And then of course, a significant reduction of emergency orders. Emergency orders are where you, it is an emergency, your plant is shut down or the operations have stopped because um, there's a, a missing part. There isn't something that is available that is needed. So common issues in inventory management, obviously finding that optimal amount of inventory to have a safety stuff. We don't need excess inventory or a copious amount of redundant inventory obviously we need some safety stock because you never know what's going to happen again i think covid the russia ukraine war has proved that the suez canal it's beneficial to have a little bit of safety stock but you don't need so much that you have stock for 18 years so machine learning can help you figure out those demand patterns what should be ordered and what is being ordered and how often should it be ordered? It can look at the data over the past number of years or depending on how long this company has been collecting it, decades, right? And then it can you know, figure out, okay, in this specific month or around these months or this you know, specific event, including you know, ice cream sales typically tied to like heat and hot weather, the hotter it is, Probably the more ice cream sales you're going to have or more football sales or um you know towels it can it can tell you that and it can sort of tell you the lead up it can show you all these different patterns based on all that data that you've um collected obviously it can help with the procurement of when you should be ordering or looking for a new part it can help you know tell you what the actual supplier lead time is because a lot of companies i've known notice I go in and they don't have the lead times in their systems like okay well we should be figuring that out and then you can use the you know, basic regression or any type of other machine learning algorithm to understand what the true supplier lead time is from the time that you place the order until the time it arrives on site and then you can look at this type of item you have it's perishable okay so you have very short shelf life you need to get that out it's consumable it's going to be eaten or used and it's not going to be um, you know put back on the shelf right uh, safety glasses at any sort of you know warehousing manufacturing construction site right you use them and you're not going to turn them in at the end of the day you typically keep them but then you'll probably end up with a few you want to have you know safety glasses that you can actually see out of the fit you know all that stuff so it can help with all of that and understand what your demand patterns need to to be so inventory management I found pairs really well with clustering Clustering is a type of machine learning, such as K nearest neighbors or K means clustering. You're just looking at all the attributes of these pieces uh, or you know these parts that you're looking for or um, anything that you're selling, particularly it doesn't necessarily need to be if, like a physical part. And you can look at the attributes of it. Okay, what is the cost? What is the shelf life on it? What do I need from that? And so we can use it for critical spares, obviously, right? Certain algorithms are fine and they'll group these parts on these attributes of like, how often is this company ordering critical spare? Or how often does this critical spare need to be reused? In ideal, like OEM, you know, manufacturing uh, statistics, it says this just should last six years. Well, it's not operating in a desert, right? When they tested this in the factory, and here we are in a desert, we've got tons of sand that can build up that can you know, ruin the filters. How often do we really need to do this? So you can then create these specific clusters based on all of this data 
that you have hopefully uh, collected. And you can create a replenishment plan for each of the cluster because the cluster is going to pull together. It's going to look at all these different parts and all the different attributes and then say, ooh, I've created sort of five or six different clusters and they are aligned because they have a similar shelf life or a similar ordering pattern um, or a similar uh, cost or they actually typically are ordered together. If I'm replacing this, this one also gets replaced. So this is that demand pattern. And you just wouldn't have thought to you know, pair some of these things together. And so it just can help you understand the patterns in your own data. And then obviously you can link these clusters or you'll even end up with a cluster of the dis, uh, decommission or disposal schedule of, okay, we know that this takes five years. We're probably not going to order any more spares when we're at four and a half years because we know that we're going to decommission this. We're moving to a new site and this is not coming. This piece of equipment is not uh, coming with us. So a specific uh, example of that, copious amounts of excess inventory in the Department of Defense, the Department of National Defense, and the Ministry of Defense. So each of these massive defense units had significant excess inventory, like to the billions of excess inventory. And not only did they have excess inventory, they didn't even have the correct parts on hand, and so they were unable to maintain their assets. Are you talking defense? a large problem right we need to be able to know that our equipment is going to function or we're going to have enough of what we need uh going forward so i took a list of uh subcontractors from the canadian department of national defense and i applied a k-means clustering algorithm so i threw hundreds of thousands of pieces of data and i had it cleaned before and i threw this into uh, machine learning software and the result came out with six clusters originally and then I looked and I was like no actually if I set a limit of five they're more distinct five two of them were quite similar and they had an overlap so it was like okay I can probably squish these together so then within the cluster each of these clusters then had its own set of attributes of like this is the typical lead time and this is a typical cost this is the type of uh, parts that fall into this so then with those attribute information um, i could create algorithms for each of these clusters so the algorithms were actually uh, cluster specific but they could be part specific as well and so it minimized this cost while maximizing the part availability so these algorithms also have helped to set ordering quantities and ordering schedules and of course then i tested it on the us um, data that they gave me and it still worked so the result was is this 34% decrease in excess inventory. So you're saving, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and, you know, 31% decrease in cost. But there was still that 100% part availability because now you had the right parts and you knew exactly when you were going to begin to need them to make sure that these assets could be, you know, in the field longer. And it's actually pretty cool because it is being used by some of the Canadian um, you know, defense uh, subcontractors, and it's it's proven to be really, really helpful for them. They've saved a lot of money while not losing or sacrificing anything else. So when applied properly, machine learning, any of those algorithms are incredibly helpful. Common issues in forecasting, obviously, I don't know what to sell or what to have on, um, you know, in the shelf or in my warehouse, right? Operational failure, obviously your machine or your asset could be failing sooner than it should be, right? We've put it into really stressful uh, situations. So the mean time to failure is actually shorter than expected. Again, if you have high turnover in a role like that, that you know knowledge loss happens and the data will still be there. So using machine learning algorithms there, super helpful, or just generally miscalculating your demand. You're just underestimating it or you're overestimating when this service should happen or this trade-off. So forecasting, easy. Apply you know, a regression uh, machine learning algorithm. So it just provides that insight into the probability of an event occurring. So you can split your data sets into when something bad happened, this machine crapped out sooner than it should have versus when it went longer than it should have. And you can find patterns in this data leading up to this event. Um, and then it'll show you, okay, certain warehouses or certain temperatures make this 
um, particular part wear out sooner. So again, these are things that are not necessarily seen by the eye because you have resource turnover in roles like that. And so sometimes you have a person, they just have a feeling about it and it's like, oh, that's cool because you've seen it for 30 plus years, but that's not necessarily the case anymore. So we need to use these machine learning algorithms to figure out what our data is saying and how we can more effectively you know, order parts. So uh, an example of actual forecasting, uh, this oil and gas company uh, collected all the data from all these different oil and gas, other oil and gas companies. So the one that I worked for was just the, the data collecting site and they wanted to figure out how can they better prevent, you know, frack loads because they're incredibly bad for the environment. They're bad for the equipment and they can impact other wells, right? So leaks, disruptions, uh, lost time due to cleanup and it's just environmentally unfriendly. So I use um, machine learning and some regression analysis. So I pulled 30 specific wells and I looked at the data um, on when they had events and when they didn't. So I sort of found three types of unique uh, signature event patterns. Um, and it was what I then figured out. It wasn't actually it didn't relate to the the change in temperature or how many wells were around it, it was a specific increase in pressure that was prompting these uh, negative fracking events. So what I then did was looked at that data and said, okay, this is the length of time it takes when this pressure hits this or the difference in the pressure is, you know, greater than 10% or greater than, you know, 20% for this length of time. Remember, I'm getting data every two seconds, so I have a lot to uh, work with. Um, you need to ease off the pressure. So what it did is the algorithms were able to, you know, predict an event, and then I got to test this in real time. And the coolest part was is that 85% uh, predictive ability while providing enough lead time for these operators to actually prevent the event from happening. So we could set out a warning system to them, and it would let them know, hey, you are trending towards this specific type of, you know, negative event. You want to dial back on your uh, frac pressure. So one final example is just everyone has issues with uh, demand, pan uh, demand planning. You want to ensure that right piece of equipment or you know finance or information is in the right place at the right time in that right quantity. Obviously, inventory issues are you know short, you're short on parts or you have too many parts, you have the incorrect parts. You don't know how well your forecast is. Um, is your service level being met? Are you actually, or is your supplier meeting that contractual obligation of, you know, their specific service level? So again, I used clustering for this because it's just a really great way to find the attributes in and around and it highlights the issue. So you can use it to alter current part classifications and better parts obviously allow for better part management or better classes because classes will tell you this is the average lead time. This is the average amount of money. This is the average uh, demand for this specific attribute. And now you can then create replenishment policies. Um, and it also will let you know one part's actually being used less or suddenly being used less than other parts. And it just gives you all of this information that you don't have to dig up. You can have you know these software add-ons to your ERPs and you can go through and collect all of this information. So with this forecasting events, we, I worked with a very large global manufacturing company and it needed to increase their part availability. They just couldn't do their preventative maintenance because they didn't have the parts on hand. And then they ended up having this uncaused downtime because something would break because they didn't do their preventative maintenance. And then we had all of this, you know, expenses in, no joke, there was a picture of a helicopter for a reason, flying parts in because not having that part on hand meant that the operations would stop, which meant that you're losing thousands upon thousands of dollars every hour or, you know, closer to hundreds of thousands of dollars every hour. So we were called in originally just to look at the fact that they had all these emergency orders, but what we really went through and realized was that it was due to a lack of part availability and not being able to do the um, performance uh, or preventative maintenance. So 
we went through and reviewed this part classification structure and they had 16 different classes. It's just mildly overwhelming. Like, how are you going to set replenishment plans and how do you really know and why do you need 16 part classifications? So we threw it into our machine learning software and just looked and used, you know, K-nearest neighbors. And we found, oh, actually, there's really only six clusters that are statistically different from each other. And so certain classes had part inventory that needed to be, you know, monitored or reviewed a lot more frequently. And others needed to have thresholds. Okay, when the inventory in the system goes down to this, we need to place an order. Um, and so it would provide all these flags. Well, what this did was allowed for increased part availability. You're not dealing with 16 different classes and 16 different replenishment, you know, plans. You now have six and we put it into their system. So it would highlight it. So as long as they continue to actually reconcile and do their inventory counts, this worked. And we told them that you have to keep, you know, doing your part so that the, you know, machine learning and the algorithms and everything that we've set up for you will also continue to work. It's that two-way street, right? If the data is inaccurate, you're going to end up with inaccurate results. So it was great because it reduced the shorts and also the excess parts and the unplanned downtime. So it was a, a significant, significant reduction in unplanned downtime. And what that did is it dropped the cost of the goods that were, you know, sold. And your preventative maintenance happened on time and it then reduced those emergency orders. So they didn't have to bring in multiple parts via helicopter in the middle of the night um, that they are getting from another continent because they had all these issues. So it just saved an incredible amount of money and it decreased that operational cost significantly. They were very happy as were their uh, shareholders. So it's really cool what you can do with, you know, machine learning and how it applies and how it's well used in supply chain. But of course, you need to set yourself up for success. So the best way to start is to you know have a specific question for the model and uh, that you are trying to answer so when will this asset fail how often do i need to order this item right be specific because if you're not you'll end up with a very generic you know boring answer that doesn't really help you then you need to make sure that your data is cleaned is cleansed it's properly labeled is properly entered because if it's not you have something that's not unique being viewed as unique. Then you wanna select the appropriate algorithm, right? You just saying, oh, we're gonna use AI or machine learning. It's like, okay, well, which machine learning algorithm is going to be best for this scenario, right? So understanding which one to use and the data that it really depends on. Then you wanna choose sort of parameters, put a limit around things um, and have a specific you know, outcome. What is the, the health of the asset? Or when does the asset go to failure? How much is too much inventory? Or how little is too little, right? Putting some limits on it. And then of course you want to let your machine learning you know, software review as much data as possible. The more data it has, the better it will do because it can find more and more patterns in it. But again, if that data isn't great, you're gonna end up where you don't hire any females or where you have a problem with some of the you know other uh, you know <laughs> hiring or a crisis in healthcare because we've used you know not great data sets so again just knowing how to set yourself up for success and telling your students how to set themselves up for success when they're trying to use it so that wraps up what i had to say about using and actually having used um uh, machine learning and AI in supply chain. So that is that is all I have for today. Thank you, Danica. That was amazing. Fascinating to listen to, um, you know, that you could help governments and companies save that much money, like 34% decrease in inventory. Yeah. That's, that's, that's insane. <laughs> it's, a lot of, it's a lot of money, right? And it's, you don't realize it until you go through and you're looking at, you know, the person in finance comes and just slides you this and says like, this is where we went. This is like the swing now that we've employed that. And you're like, there's a lot of zeros after that number. Yeah. So it's cool. It's it, yeah. because it does, it's money that 
is useful elsewhere, right? It's, and you just don't know. But again, you can, you can go the opposite way. You can end up spending and blowing budgets because you've used AI in, you know, the wrong way, essentially. You haven't cleaned your data, and so it's just running amok with it. Because again, it doesn't have that intuition like humans do. Yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I want to invite anyone, if you have any specific questions for Danica, go ahead and you can enter that in the chat right now. Um, I also want to um, let you know that Danica has a case study that she wants to share with everyone, and we're going to be putting that in the um, handout section right now. So that should be popping up on your screen. So go ahead and click and you can download that. That's um, something that you can use in your classroom. It is on the fracturing, uh, the fracturing that you were talking about. So, or Yeah. So um, also um, just, it looks like, I don't know, I don't see any questions popping up, but you're very detailed, Danica. <laughs> I think that, I think that might be the reason why, but I was just wondering um, if you have like, what's been it sounds like you've worked in such a variety yep. uh of fields and and such what's been the most um fun project that you've worked on what's been the most or like maybe the one that was the most shocking to you like the results were the most shocking um i think it definitely would have been some of the stuff that i did for the uh, military just you don't really realize the impact because I think most governments just throw money at it. And it's like, okay, we'll, we'll just fix it. We'll, we'll throw money at the problem. And then seeing how some simple understanding of their data can actually really help pull, um, you know, make things better in all aspects, right? Like you still ended up with all this part availability. In fact, the part availability increased, yet the cost decreased. And you're like, that doesn't make sense. Um, and then obviously I'm using it with, all the research I'm doing for my PhD and people don't understand. They're like, Oh, like how does supply chain and, and medicine go? It's like, well, I'm trying to improve a specific function so that patients going through their supply chain of like finding a specialist of getting diagnosed happens a lot faster. So it's, it's great in uh, medicine, but it's also hilarious when you get given data and you're like, I don't think this is really, clean and then you look at the results you're like that yep, that doesn't make sense um so yeah some of the healthcare stuff i've done and then some of the honestly all the projects i think they're all super fun because i quite often find different things i worked for i did work for a transportation company and they they could have they would have sold their soul saying that this was the problem and i found that it was not and all the data said elsewise um that the thing that they thought was not the problem at all was helping was actually the the big hindrance so it's just um amazing to use all this data awesome. yeah yeah well we do have a couple questions coming through now so um gary's asking how can we use ai to teach supply chain any good tips um use ai to actually teach it well what you could have is you can show just the difference in having good data versus bad data because i think in supply chain in general using AI or not using AI, decisions are made based on data that's collected. So showing your students, hey, we can use this fancy technology all you want, but if you put in crappy data, you're going to get it out. So you can use, uh, like, say, chat GPT off of OpenAI and have them ask it, you know, pretty generic questions or like, how would you design a supply chain for this or a procurement process? And then give it really specifics and see the outcome to show them, like, this is why you need to do all your work. AI is not going to do everything for you. You have to do a lot of the legwork beforehand and then show them that the outcomes are so different. Because I also teach project management and I have some of my students, I'm like, yeah, go for it, use AI. And you'll see that if you, again, like the garbage in, garbage out, if you put crappy info in, you're going to get a crappy uh, result out. So just showing them how beneficial it is or can be when they've set themselves up for success in using it. Or you can have them use uh, some of the like open AI software to run, you know, demand planning and then don't clean the data for them. And then just tell them to like run it without cleaning it and then tell them to run it 
after they've cleaned the data and they can look at that, the differences in the outcomes that they find, like sometimes they will get lucky and other times they won't. So that's a couple of the ways to do it. Nice. <clears throat> um, Teresa's asking uh, if you've noticed in your research any disparity in accuracy in, use, in the use of AI over time. Absolutely. Again, it just, it depends on the data that the algorithms are using. So if you already have discrepancies in the data and what it's pulling through, it's going to continue down that trend. It's just an echo chamber. And so if there's continuously, you know, bad data put in or not accurately labeled or, or descriptive data, it can get worse and worse and worse and you get farther and farther off, of course. And sometimes you don't really know what the actual course is supposed to be. And so you've been pulled off to the side and you don't know it until it's too late. Point in case like that. Um, Amazon example with their hiring is like, oh, this is great until it would not hire or recommend a single female because it's like, oh, it was actively weeding them out because it's looking at this already biased data set. So that's part of the problem. The other part is the trust. So we know that in certain types of medicine, especially like the radiology side, that AI is so strong. It's very good because it's very clean um, data sets, but then you have the technicians, the radiologists that don't necessarily want to trust it. So then they'll do their own and then it's like, oh my gosh, you've actually pulled it off course. So yeah, there it's, it's something to be very careful of and aware. And I think that's the most important part for me is like you need to understand how these algorithms work because once you understand it, you can see how you can end off, end up off course. So it's that understanding. I think we need to have a better understanding uh, humans do of how it functions and how it works and how the data that you give it is so uh, crucial to its um, output. Thanks, Danica. Um, RG is asking, with the very fluid sanctions and the like, how can we use AI to predict supply chain issues and alternatives? Um, again, so you're looking at it at previous data. So perhaps maybe not predicting the issues, but it can highlight if this event happens, this is what you should do, or you can stock a little bit more. I think we're so focused on that lean supply chain where we don't, we want like just in time. We don't have inventory on hand anymore. It's like, oh, that's a waste of money. We can do other things. And then you have a big issue that happens. So I think if anything, it's shown that there needs to be a little bit more redundancy because when these events do occur and they are using ai in you know weather prediction and whatnot but with supply chain again it's so personal to each company how it operates so i would use it more not to predict like different supply chain events but for each company to use it to say okay if this happens what happens to your supply chain or how does your supply chain function and where are your suppliers located? Just having a better understanding so that when something bad does happen, a recall on a really important product, um, how they can adjust or they have things, you know, backup plans. So setting it to, you know, test your own supply chain rather than predicting future risk, because I mean, that's really hard to do. You can just predict how it'll impact or how previous events have impacted your company and then having um, a plan to handle that. So having a little bit more inventory or noticing, ooh, there's some civil unrest in some places where we are going. So maybe we need to uh, have better supplies on hand or more of this type. So I think that's more of a way that we can look at it because like supply chain is, is so personal to each company and then globally each company impacts that supply chain. But if we look at you know ourselves first, try and figure out the issues with our own company or where we could go wrong, then we'll improve that global supply chain with uh, when those events occur. Great. Thanks, Danica. Um, we have some good comments, um, even some tips that professors, uh, Brennan has a good tip in here of, of how he uses uh, AI and chat GPT with his students. So I encourage you to read those. We're, we're out of time for our questions, but if you have any additional questions or would like to connect with Danica, feel free to click a link that we're going to put on the screen here and you can connect with her. Danica, thank you so much thank for you. this presentation. 
it was so insightful and, and interesting. And uh, I'm excited to look over the case study that you gave out. That'll so thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you.